What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. If you're joining us on the podcast or if you're joining us via YouTube, thank you for spending your time with me on this beautiful, beautiful Monday evening. Week ones is in the novels. Well, not really in the novels, not in the books yet, because Monday Night Football is literally on right now. I'm going to be taping this video throughout the commercial breaks of the uh, Jets and Lions game in in perfect Jets fashion. Uh, Sam Darnold threw a pick six on his first pass, which is just literally the most Jets thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I feel horrible for my friends that are Jets. Very humbling. You know what else is humbling? The first week of the NFL season. The first week of fantasy football is arguably the most humbling thing on planet Earth. The reason is I spend so much damn time talking about players throughout the summer and analyzing and doing all these things, and then you just get shit on sometimes, right? Like Chris Hogan catching one ball after I talked for four months about how he's going to be a god with Tom Brady. You know, it does feel good when players like Jimmy Graham play like ass crack after I shit on him all summer. So... You know, there's wins, there's losses. All we can do is take the information at hand and move forward with it, which is why I'm bringing to you my waiver wire video, which I will be doing every Tuesday. Now, waiver wires are very hot in the beginning of the year because we don't actually know who are, um, you know, the starters in all situations, who's going to be getting the opportunities, who where, where the depth charts really stand for the first few weeks of the season. So now is the time to hop on your waiver wire and make sure you take advantage of these top players. And just like these depth charts, I'm as well figuring out how I want to maneuver my season. Thus, we will be doing the top waiver wire ads every Tuesday. My fan submitted Q&A questions will now come on Thursday because I realize a lot of you guys have questions regarding players that were playing in Thursday Night Football. So that was pretty dumb of me to have those on Saturday. So from now on, the Q&As um, will be on Thursday. So if you want to submit your question to be answered on my uh, Q&A video on Thursday, you got to go to the Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash BDGE fantasy football. And you just send the page a message, whatever it is. With the hashtag answer my Zam question, make sure you include the week, right? Because I'm going to have a lot of messages in there. So if it's for week two, obviously, put week two, put your scoring settings, and then put the players. That's all I ask of you. So if you want to try to be featured on Thursday's video, make sure you do that. Saturday will be the uh, top DFS plays as well as wide receiver cornerback matchups to exploit, maybe some must-starts and random things throughout the week. So that will be the schedule. For now, we're going to get into my top waiver wire ads for each position, uh, along with whether or not I would use my top waiver wire spot on them and the amount of fab I would use on these players. So let's get cracking. In order to make this list, every player has to be under 55% owned in Yahoo leagues. All right, so if you're highly owned, obviously I'm not going to tell you to try to pick up your guy because he's probably not available in your league. So 55% or under in Yahoo leagues. Obviously, since we're watching the Monday Night Football right now, the Jets, Lions, Raiders, and Rams players will not be included on this list. Obviously, if like Todd Gurley goes down, John Kelly's a pickup. I have a feeling there's going to be a couple players from the Jets team that we're going to see emerge as fantasy assets throughout the year. If I had to put a gut feeling on it, it's going to be Blau Powell and it's going to be Kinsey and Nunwa. I'm not sure what their own owner percentage is, but keep an eye out for them too before we start. But let's get into the quarterbacks. First up on this list is Case Keenum of the Denver Broncos. Yahoo ownership, 25%. Available in 75% of leagues. Now he unsurprisingly had a good week one. I had been saying pretty much all offseason that I think he's going to have a good season. Uh, his volume is going to be a lot higher in Denver, as well as, you know, it's not like he had a, a, a drop-off in weapons. Obviously, Diggs and Thielen are very good players, but going over to Denver doesn't mean he is losing a, a ton of firepower there, right? So they play Seattle in their first game against a depleted secondary. He throws for 329 passing yards, three touchdowns, three interceptions to go along with that. So if you are in a high interception penalty uh, league, then that's obviously going to hurt you. But 329 for three touchdowns is very good. 25 of 39 passing. Um, and as expected... Keenum put his talented weapon group to use. Um, he targeted Sanders 11 times, DT 10 times, Sutton got involved catching two balls for 45 yards, uh, a couple big plays, and it looks like they'll they'll have a legitimate passing back or passing passing down back in Philip Lindsay, who we'll get to later on this list, of course. Um, now, we saw Keenum target uh, the running back position a ton in Minnesota, and now with a guy like Lindsay, who is a prolific pass catcher coming out of college, this should bode well for Keenum's uh, floor, you know, because he loves to target these running backs. You have a good running back. The math heads up here, people. We'll put it that way. Um, so the thing to take away here, I think, is that Keenum threw the ball 39 times in this game in week one. Uh, that was a number he hit just twice in his 15 regular 
season games last year for Minnesota. Like I said, the volume was not really there for Keenum in Minnesota. Now you move over to the Broncos, who run a lot of plays. They had, I think they were the second highest. This is crazy. I remember looking at it this summer. For a team that really performed poorly, they ran the second most plays in the NFL last year. Um, so they're going to have a much higher volume, especially on the passing side of things, than Keenum had in Minnesota last year. Uh, and you look back at those two games in which he hit 39 pass attempts. In both of those games, he had at least 280 passing yards and multiple scores. Now, week two, he gets an Oakland pass defense, who we'll see Jared Goff probably wipe the floor with tonight. I I'm probably going to sound like an idiot if that's not the case. But either way, Oakland's not going to be a good pass defense. Keenum gets them at home, so he will definitely be a viable uh, week two streamer. As well as week four, he gets Kansas City at home. And guys, this whole this whole video, this whole blog post, I know a lot of you guys always talk about timestamps and stuff. All of these videos are in blog, blah, 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 blog post form on my website, bigdogsfantasy.com. So you could just read this rather than going through the entire video if you want, if you're lazy like my ass is. So go to the blog post and you can see Yahoo ownership. You could see next three matchups. You could see whether or not I'd use the waiver wire, my number one waiver wire on him, and you would you can see the fab budget I would spend on him. So Case Keenum, like I said, good week one, a lot of volume, should continue to see volume, gets Oakland at home in week two. Let's see what Sam Darnold is doing over here. Who made that play? Anunwa. I fumbled. He is uh he's starting Anunwa a lot on this first drive. I'm telling you, man, I think Anunwa is gonna come out as the uh, as the pass catcher to own in New York this year. So, quarterback number two, we have Tyrod Taylor of the Cleveland Browns, 12% owned in Yahoo Leagues. Here's a takeaway from this one. Here is the takeaway from this one. Tyrod Taylor was 15 for 40 in pass attempts in this week one game. 15 for 40 for 197 yards. He still finished as a top five fantasy quarterback, guys. No one is here to argue whether or not Tyrod Taylor is a top five pocket quarterback. No one gives a shit. This is a fantasy video. He went 15 for 40 throwing the ball, less than 200 yards, top five fantasy quarterback. That is the takeaway here. Ahead of Tom Brady in week one, that is thanks to his tremendous rushing floor. He is averaging, his career averages when he's a starting quarterback is like 37 rushing yards per game. And he actually shit on that in this game. You look at this game, right? 37.5% completion percentage, throwing the ball, 15 for 40. That's that's what the math adds out to be. Only Nathan Peterman had a lower completion percentage among starting quarterbacks in week, week one. And uh, much of this can be probably attributed to the weather in Cleveland. I know it was supposed to be like hurricanes and shit there. When you're watching on TV, it literally didn't even look like it was raining. So I don't know, someone who maybe went to the Cleveland game, let me know what was going on in Cleveland, that things were so crazy that they were, they were supposed to cancel the game and shit. Didn't even look like it was raining there, but I'm going to say that that probably had to do with some of the turnovers and, and all the, the madness that was going on in that game. But I'm not too worried about his, his uh, passing efficiency. So along with his 200 passing yards and his one score to Josh Gordon, which was a beautiful catch by Gordon, by the way, uh, Taylor led NFL QBs in week one with 77 rushing yards on eight carries, and he did score a rushing touchdown. And that, of course, is why you use a guy like Tyrod Taylor. And in better we we weather conditions with a group of weapons that he has never had in his career, Taylor's passing stats will be much better in following weeks, will be more efficient uh, while still providing you three to four extra fantasy points a week due to his legs, if not eight to 10, if he ends up getting into the end zone. So that is why I love Tyrod Taylor going forward. Now that better weather will come as soon as next week when they travel to New Orleans to face off against the Saints in that dome. Now the Saints obviously uh, just had an interesting week one, right? The Saints defense was pegged to be this amazing defense and they were, everyone was talking about how they were going to be so good and, and real Super Bowl contenders. Now I'm not obviously ready to write them off after week one, but but, but, you got to be a little bit concerned as a Saints fan when you let Ryan Fitzpatrick go for 417 passing yards on you, four passing touchdowns. He added 36 rushing yards and a score. You think Ryan Fitzpatrick adding 36 rushing yards and a score is scary? What the fuck is Tyrod Taylor going to do to y'all on the ground? I don't know, bro, but in that dome, uh, Tyrod Taylor is going to fly, and I think he is going to put up another big fantasy week in week two. Um, if you decide to pick him up and you decide to sit him against the Saints for whatever reason, that's all right, but you could definitely use him in week three. He's at home against the Jets, and then he plays at Oakland. Two more easy matchups. So would I use the number one waiver on him? No. Uh, fab spend would probably be between 3 and $5. That is quarterback number two. Quarterback number three is Mitchell Trubisky of the Chicago Bears. Yahoo ownership at 18%. Now, Sunday Night Football wasn't a completely encouraging game for the sophomore quarterback, Mitchell Trubisky, but he made a couple of great throws. And uh, this offense 
also ran pretty well entire, like as a team. They looked pretty good. It looked much improved, obviously, um, and it was pretty easy to see like right off the rip. Mitchell Trubisky was shooting balls in that we did not see him do last year. Hold on, we have a touchdown. Who, sh who done scored? Was it Crowell? Crowell got in on a goal line carry, whatever. Whatever, I'm over it. I still want Powell in PPR leagues. So yeah, Mitch Trubisky came out of the gate firing. He ended up completing 23 of 35 passes for 171 yards. Obviously, that's not that's not too encouraging. Um, but he did add seven carries for 32 yards and a rushing touchdown. So like Tyrod, Trubisky has that rushing floor that always kind of seems to ease the mind of fantasy owners. Now, Trubisky, you know, he looked to have a solid rapport with Allen Robinson, um, who led the team with 61 receiving yards, but no one had a big day statistically in the receiving game. I think those will definitely come in time as they get more comfortable with this offense and as, um, you know, it was just like a weird game script between the Bears and the Packers, obviously, because Cleo Mack was literally like single-handedly winning the game for the Bears for a while. Um, so it wasn't like the offense had a lot of time and a lot of plays to really come together and put a string of of, uh, of big numbers together. So I think that will also come in time. So what's more, it was more encouraging, kind of like how I pointed out with Keenum, is the 35 pass attempts from Trubisky. He hit that number just three times in his 12 starts in 2017. And in two of those three games, he threw for at least 295 yards. So in a creative offense like this, um, if Trubisky can string together more positive passing performances going forward and keeps throwing the ball accurately and, gr and gains this rapport with these receivers, it seems to be a really good situation for him. And now he also not only has Tariq Cohen, but Jordan Howard somehow grew some hands this offseason, right? He caught all five of his targets. So he has two running backs that he can actually rely on to catch balls out of the backfield. So over his next three matchups... He gets Seattle at home at Arizona, then Tampa Bay at home. So two of them are at home. You have Seattle, who just led up 329 yards, three passing touchdowns to Case Keenum. You have Arizona on the road, 255 yards, and two touchdowns to Alex Smith. And then you have Tampa Bay at home, who obviously just allowed 429 yards and three passing touchdowns to Drew Brees. So Mitchell Trubisky is more of a long-term play for me, although you can use him probably at Seattle or at home against Seattle and then home against Tampa Bay. So I would probably be looking to throw maybe 5 to $8 on Trubisky, hoping that he can evolve into you know a low-end quarterback one as the season progresses. So that is going to do it for the quarterback section. Now, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic did not make this list. And the reason is because they get Philly next week. And I'm not really buying into the whole storyline that they are not going to start Jameis Winston when he gets back. I mean, Winston, if if they believe, I, I feel like if they didn't think Winston was the future of this court, if they didn't want to give him a chance to be the future of this franchise, they probably would have cut him already. Uh, and if that's not the case, then they're probably going to see what they have with him over the remaining portion of the season. I think they're going to give him one last chance to really win this role. So when, when Winston returns, which is in week four, uh, I believe he will be on the field. So really, you're not going to want to start Ryan Fitzpatrick against Philly, and then you'll have one week. So I'm not really breaking the bank on him, and I, I, I don't know, dude. I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to buy someone with my fab. Y'all know the the importance of the time value of money, right? You spend money on him now, or you wait on it, right? It, it's money is cheaper when you wait on it. If you spend it now, it's more expensive than if you spend the same amount in a week. You know what I mean? So that's why, that's really why we ain't buying Ryan Fitzpatrick. It's the time value of money. Time value continuum of Ryan Fitzpatrick. If I name my episode something, that would be the name of him. But that wraps up the quarterback section. Just realized how long this video probably is going to end up being. Quarterback section took a little, took a minute. So the running back and the wide receiver section is going to take a few minutes if we are doing that math correctly. Uh, before we jump into the running backs, I will say if you want my weekly rankings as well as the master stat sheet that I will be providing to y'all which includes goal line, red zone, touches, snaps, snap count percentages, all that kind of stuff. All a bunch of fantasy statistics you would be looking for in one place. As well as a private live stream that I'll be doing every Wednesday evening. Um, as well as early access to my blog posts and stuff. That is patreon.com slash bdge. That is where you will sign up for a monthly subscription. And you will be getting my weekly rankings along with that other good stuff. So just wanted to plug that before we head into the running backs. And now we go. Waiver wire pickup at the running back position is none other than Philip Lindsay, running back for the Denver Broncos. Currently owned in just 3% of Yahoo leagues. I would highly suggest if for some reason he's available in your dynasty leagues, go pick him up ASAP. The concerns for Royce Freeman coming into this year were his lack of involvement in the passing game. Not that he can't catch, but that the Broncos won't use him in that facet of the game. And it turns out that those concerns were well warranted. Uh, but not because of Devontae Booker. Now, that was the point. A lot of people will probably be like, oh, you loved Booker. No, I didn't love Booker. I just 
was worried about Freeman because there was going to be involvement from the passing game. And, of course, I thought it was going to be Booker at the time, but the concerns are still the same concerns. It just so happens to be Philip Lindsay instead of Devontae Booker. So insert Lindsay for Booker. Philip Lindsay is an undrafted free agent out of the University of Colorado. Uh, reports out of camp all summer pegged Lindsay as this huge, unexpected, positive part of the training camp. Obviously, if you're an undrafted free agent, you're not expected to make the team. Uh, you have a long way to go for making the team. Um, so the fact that he was getting reports about him really showing up and being one of the breakout stars of camp puts him on the map. Now, you take a look at Lindsay. This is his player profiler profile. He has him listed as 5'7", 184 pounds. Roto World has him at 5'8", 190 pounds. So he might be a little smaller, he might be a little bigger. Either way, he is uh, of the smaller kind. For This is for the people that don't really know Lindsay or didn't watch the Broncos game at all this weekend. His role is going to be in the passing game. Um, you can see by the metrics that he is very quick. Uh, 71st percentile burst score, a 92nd percentile 40-yard dash, 4.44 speed, which gives him that home run breakaway speed. 85th percentile college dominator, more importantly, 92nd percentile in terms of college target share. He had almost 15% of his college team's targets. Being the role that he's probably going to play in this Broncos offense, along with carrying the ball, uh, you look at his production in college. Look at that junior and senior season, guys. He went for over 1,700 scrimmage yards in both his junior and senior seasons. And you look at that 2017 season. He had 301 carries, which led the NCAA. Led the NCAA in carries, did Philip Lindsay in 2017. Given his build, he probably won't develop into an NFL workhorse, but you should see that he's done it before, and he's done it successfully, and he's been a monster. He scored 32 touchdowns over the final two years. He's caught a total of 76 passes. He is someone that can be used in every facet of the game. He should be added in every league. Um, Royce Freeman ended up playing on 29 of 74 snaps. Lindsey was right behind him playing on 26 of 74 snaps, and Booker was down at 19 of 74 snaps. So it was Freeman, Lindsey, Booker. Freeman and Lindsey both rushed exactly 15 times for 71 yards, 4.7 yards per carry, but Lindsey caught two of three targets for 31 yards and a touchdown. Freeman was not targeted at all. Booker got two targets. So Lindsey was not only the, well, tied for the leading rusher, 15 rushes, but he was also the leading targeted running back out of that backfield. So that is a, that's a good sign if you are a Philip Lindsay owner. While both backs, if not all three, will be involved going forward in the Broncos game plan, I think that Booker will eventually probably be phased out because he's obviously the least talented one in this backfield. They're probably still going to use a hot hand approach. Uh, Freeman is still going to be their goal line back. Now, they didn't have the chance to show that in this first game, but he did so in uh, in most of the preseason games, or he was a goal line back in the preseason game, scoring touchdowns like every time he basically got, got a goal line touch. Um, so he should still have that, but we saw throughout, uh, Lindsay should have a very heavy role on a week to week basis, as well as in bad game scripts. He's going to be a very heavily used running back. Now they get two home games, um, and great matchups over the next three weeks in week two, they're Oakland at home. They have KC at home in week four. And I think Lindsay can literally be used as a flex option already in PPR formats as early as next week. So would I use the number one waiver wire spot on him? Yes, indeed I would. PPR leagues, uh, I would spend probably between 15 and 20, depending on how aggressive your league is, maybe up to 23 ish dollars on Philip Lindsay. And the next guy up, yo, Matt Safford just threw a pick to Tremaine Johnson, and Kenny Galladay, I'm pretty sure, might have just ended his whole, his, his whole entirety. Like, he just ended the, the whole life of Tremaine Johnson. Rest in peace to him. The other, the other, Rest in peace, I must say right now, this is actually a good segue, is to uh, Leonard Fournette and to Leonard Fournette owners. So, uh, this is time to take a victory lap if you were someone who faded Leonard Fournette this season because you were worried about his injury concerns because about eight seconds into the Jags' week one game against the G-Men, Fournette left the game due to a hamstring injury headed into the locker room and was seen afterwards noticeably limping. There were reports that he was going to try to get back into the game, but not a chance. Um, head coach Doug Marone said afterwards that it's not a big injury, um, that he's optimistic about the injury and he doesn't consider it serious, but as a Fournette owner, you absolutely should, given his injury history, given what I've been preaching on this channel for the last few months, guys, don't find injuries, they will find you. So, re dude, I'm so upset with myself because, like I talked all summer, I was like, as soon as these guys got injured, right, it was Jarek McKinnon, it was Doug Baldwin, it was Greg Olson, it's like as soon as these guys got injured, or these guys were like, you know, set up to be injured, whatever, um, 
I was like, you got to avoid them anywhere near their cost. And I guess I didn't take that to a serious enough extent because in my E-Town Get Down League, I took Baldwin. He fell to me in the, at the end of the sixth round. So I'm like, okay, like I feel like that's enough ADP baked into his price, right? The end of the sixth round, most people took Baldwin probably third or fourth round at this point or when drafts were happening. So I felt okay doing it in the sixth round. Greg Olson in the ninth round, I wasn't happy about it when I took him. But I guess the lesson to be learned here is, guys, unless an injured player, right? If only Doug Baldwin had told us he was injured. Unless an injured player is falling to you at a ridiculous price. Like, I saw a lot of people taking Alshon Jeffrey in, like, the 11th, 12th round. I'm fine with that. But I guess I will forever, forever, never again take an injured player, someone injured going to the season within, like, the top six rounds. Probably the top eight from now on. Um, so I learned my lesson. That's what I got. And now obviously Fournette wasn't injured going to the year, but the fact of the matter is now that he is injured, this is something that may linger on the entire year. This is something that if he returns too quickly has a very high risk of re-injury or injuring something else. So with Fournette gone, TJ Yeldon, their second string running back operated as the featured back, which is a role that is projected to be very, 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 very high volume. And Fournette left in the second quarter of the game. By that point, he already had nine carries and three receptions. You were seeing how involved he was going to be. He was going to be an absolute monster here if he could stay healthy. But for the remainder of the game, Yeldon out snapped Corey Grant 39 to 7. Uh, Yeldon saw 17 touches in those 39 snaps. Two, Corey Grant's just one. So he out-touched him 17-1, to one, out-snapped him 39-7. to seven. So Yeldon is clearly the featured back in this offense going forward if Fournette misses time. Yeldon, uh, he wasn't great in the game. He turned 14 carries into 51 yards, but he did see a team-high seven targets. He caught three of them for 18 yards and a touchdown, which is something that Yeldon should be heavily involved in going forward as both a passing back and a pass-catching back. Um, like I said, he's going to be used very heavily if Fournette misses time. So this is a, a situation to monitor very closely. However, I would still take Philip Lindsay at this point, knowing what we know, because we don't know what Fournette's situation is. The hamstring is obviously a very tricky one, and one that could cost him, you know, one week, could cost him three weeks. It could cost him actually one week, and then they use him on a limited basis, which would kind of screw both Fournette and Yeldon's value. Um, but if uh, Fournette ends up missing time, if he ends up missing multiple weeks, Yeldon will definitely be a plug-and-play RB2 with a high-volume floor. Uh, he gets three straight home games against New England, Tennessee, New York Jets over their next, over their next three. Um, so would I use my number one waiver wire on him if Philip Lindsay is gone? Yes. Or, or if I am a Fournette owner for insurance, I definitely would. Fab spend between $12 and $18 I put. So CJ Yeldon, running back number two. All right. I'm going to try to move through these guys quickly so this video is in 42 hours long and you guys can actually maybe use some of this information on your waiver wire. Next up is Austin Eckler. Austin Eckler? 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 I don't know how to say this shit. Someone let me know down below with the pronunciation of the Los Angeles Chargers. Currently owned in 17% of Yahoo Leagues. Now, I don't want everyone to go nuts here just because the Chargers' week one performance was one of a lot of statistical goodness. Everybody had good games in this Chargers offense, but it was clear that they're featured uh, game plan was to heavily involve these running backs, and it did come against a terrible, terrible Chiefs defense. Um, even with Melvin Gordon touching the ball 24 times, nine of them being reception, uh, Eckler managed to get double-digit touches, something he did not get a lot in 2017. But what he did do a lot in 2017 is turn those limited touches into very high output. Now, he rushed five times for 39 yards in this one, 7.8 yards per carry. More importantly, he added 87 yards and touchdown through the air, catching all five of his targets. Now, Gordon did see 76% of the running back snaps in this one. Eckler had 27%, obviously a little bit of overlap. They were playing together on some touches, but when given the touches, Eckler has always been incredible. He's always been super efficient, uh, but still at just 27% of the team snaps, it's going to be hard to predict his output on a week-over-week -week basis, and I'm not really comfortable using him in my flex yet, but of course, if something were ever to happen to Gordon... He becomes an instant RB2 with a major, major upside, especially in PPR leagues. And right now, on any given week, he could give you RB2 production like he did this week, which is probably way better. What is that? 125, 127 total yards, five catches, and a touchdown. That's that's RB1 performance right there. Um, so he can give you those weeks on any given any given Sunday, baby. Shout out Al Pacino. Next three matchups are at Buffalo, at Los Angeles, and home against San Fran. Would I use the number one waiver wire on him? No, I would think about it if I was a Melvin Gordon owner. Uh, my fab spend on him would probably be between five and seven bucks or 10 plus bucks if I am a Gordon owner. So Austin Eckler, fire him up in your free agent list. And Kinsey Nuwa is getting peppered with targets by Sam Darnold. So when I get to the wide receiver spot, he's not on the list, but he 
will be one of the uh, hot waiver wire ads. He was awesome, awesome in 2016 before he eventually had a season-ending injury last year. Um, I was really high on him, uh, but again, he missed the entire season, so people kind of forgot about him, but he's a freak athlete, crazy metrics, huge speed, all the good stuff. And Robbie Anderson's getting hit for a loss of nine yards on an end around when they needed one yard. Great play calling. We'll move on to number four. And I actually had Kenneth Dixon as number four until we heard that he's going to be out for multiple weeks with a knee injury. But it's Suck Allen of the Baltimore Ravens. And if you're looking for him in Yahoo, he will be listed under Javorius Allen, not Suck or Buck Allen. Um, that might be for other websites as well. Owned in 3% of Yahoo leagues. Now, the Ravens' backfield is still a mess for fantasy purposes, and it's hard to say that it's got any clearer following that their week one blowout of Buffalo, of the Buffalo Petermans, I should say. Uh, they lost 47-3, to Buffalo did. Now, Alex Collins was the starter. Uh, he rushed the ball seven times for 13 yards, including a beautiful touchdown run in which he powered his way through a bunch of arm tackles. But he was briefly benched following a fumble in the second quarter. He also lost a handoff in the first quarter, so they were concerned about him his ball security issues, because that was something that held him back early in the season last year, too. So that's something to keep an eye on. But the score was 26 nothing at halftime, and the Ravens really saw no reason to keep Alex Collins in after that. So I think that was a reason why if people are freaking out about Alex Collins. I would not be freaking out yet. Um, it, the fumble kind of put him on the hay side, on the waste side, I guess I should say, for the offense in Baltimore there. Um, and then they just got up so big, so they didn't need to use him. Now, all three Ravens running backs scored a rushing touchdown in this one. Buck Allen actually led the team in uh, snaps. He saw 38% of the snaps. Collins saw 30 and Dixon saw 29%. However, the big news following this game is that uh, Kenneth Dixon will miss some time. Like I said, with a knee injury, the term sometime is always scary. It's never good because that usually means if, if you're not calling him day to day, that usually means it's going to be week to week and week to week in the middle of the season tends to linger and it tends to affect the entire season. So that's Horrible news for anyone that was, for some reason, still on the Kenneth Dixon bandwagon. So we're down to just Collins and Suck, and Allen is clearly going to be used in this offense, and he is probably going to be the primary pass-catching back, unfortunately, here. Um, he tied for the team high with six targets, and he led the team with five catches. Uh, of course, he turned those five catches into a miserable 15 yards or 2.5 yards per target. So he's not efficient whatsoever, but the volume will be there. So he's a good add in PPR formats, but he does not project to get a ton of uh, work rushing the ball behind Collins, who is clearly a starter there in Baltimore in my eyes. So he gets at Cincinnati, home versus Denver, at Pittsburgh over the next three. Uh, would I use my number one waiver wire on Suck Allen? Fuck no. Uh, fab spend probably between 5 and $7 if I'm in a PPR league. I'm probably avoiding if I'm not in a PPR. Another great ad in PPR leagues would be James White of the New England Patriots. Only owning 49% of Yahoo leagues. Um, I can't support say I'm surprised sitting here at the end of week one and splurting out to you guys that James White led the Patriots in targets. Shouldn't come as a surprise to me. Shouldn't come as a surprise to you, even though it did come as a surprise to me, of course. But while Burke had led the uh, backfield in touches with 19, that's a heavy workload. So anyone like trying to sell you Burkhead, I would buy. He had 19 touches and uh, Brady overthrew him on an easy 20-yard touchdown pass on like a wheel route that Brady hits nine out of ten times. So Burkhead should have had a monster game. But White saw nine targets. Burkhead only saw three targets. It caught four of them, 38 yards, but he did score a touchdown, which is what you might get on any given day from James White. Uh, he did get five carries for 18 yards as well. Per Adam Leviton, White lined up in the slot seven times and three times out wide, which is a good thing because as uh, Julian Edelman's out, James White will continue to see routes in the slot. And per Matt Berry, and this literally might be the first and possibly only time I've ever quoted something from Matt Berry on my channel, but he did tweet out something that was actually valuable for once. He tweeted out that no quarterback has more passing touchdowns to running backs over the past three seasons, 24, uh, than Tom Brady. And White came into the season as the only running back with three plus touchdowns, three plus catching touchdowns in each of the past three seasons. I don't really care about that because who gives a shit about three receiving touchdowns um, but it's notable that Tom Brady obviously throws a ton to running backs and a ton of you know scores to running backs so I think the takeaway here is that uh, unless it's going to be a ridiculously bad game script for White and they're going to be leading by a ton which might happen with the Patriots uh, he'll still be heavily involved especially while Julian Edelman is sitting out over the first four weeks so over the next two weeks the pass travel to Jacksonville and to Detroit uh, before a home game against Miami so they might be huge favorites uh, against Miami in that week four game, but those two games on the road, right, at Jacksonville, at Detroit, I do expect that to be uh, not a very easy game for the Pats, so they should still be, James White should still still be very heavy, heavily utilized in those games. So White's obviously a better PPR play, um, 
I would not use the number one waiver wire on him. My fab spend in PPR leagues would probably be between seven and eight dollars, and in standard league, I don't really like him that much, but it's probably between three and five dollars. And next, we'll move to the Indianapolis. Ooh, Stafford looks like he's hurt a little bit. Uh oh, he's holding his knee. Oh no, he's good. I'm lying. I just be making shit up sometimes. He was rolling around though. I think it was like a bruise. Come on, Staff, show me something, baby. What you got? Into the ground. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, so it's Indianapolis Colts. Yeah, buckle your seatbelt up here. This might be a long one. Indianapolis Colts. We have Marlon Mack, Jordan Wilkins, Naeem Hines. They all make this list. All three of them, surprisingly. So, Marlon Mack, 51% owned. Jordan Wilkins, 36% owned. Naeem Hines, 5% owned. Now, it definitely was not an inspiring week one performance from anyone in the Indianapolis backfield. But we do have some takeaways. Um, and I went back and I rewatched the entire Colts side uh, of the game. I went on Game Pass and I basically watched every snap from the offense and every running back touch. So Wilkins was a starter and he handled a very heavy workload. He got 17 touches. So not very heavy, but a pretty pretty good starter size workload, right? And if you were to tell me prior to the game that Wilkins was going to get 17 touches, I would feel pretty good about having him in my lineup. And there were a lot of preseason comparisons I think Mike Taglieri first uh, first said this, that Wilkins reminded him of Matt Forte. And after watching the game, here's what I could say. Here's what I said. I say I agree with that comparison. I agree that Jordan Wilkins is very similar to Matt Forte in the skill set. In that Wilkins doesn't do anything exceptionally, but he does everything pretty good. What I would say is Jordan Wilkins is Matt Forte if you slowed him down. So, you know how on YouTube videos, like if you guys are watching me right now, and you can go on a little settings button, and you can go playback speed, and you can put it at 1.5x, or you can put it at 0.5x, Jordan Wilkins is pretty much Matt Forte at 0.75x. So he does everything that Matt Forte can do, but at a much slower rate of play. That's how I look at Jordan Wilkins with, with Matt Forte. I think that's how you guys should think of Matt Forte, or Jordan Wilkins, I should say. So Wilkins rushed 14 times for 40 yards, 2.9 yards per carry. He caught all three of his targets for 21 yards. Wilkins, is, uh, his numbers were very pedestrian, but I watched, you know, I watched his runs, and uh, he had almost no room to work with there. Their offensive line was not blocking well for, uh, for him in this one in his defense. Now, he, Naeem Hines... Ran the ball five times, 19 yards, but he did see nine targets, and he caught seven of them for 33 yards. Now, one of those games, I think, was 17 yards, which means that he caught the other six passes for 16 yards, which is very, very, very the opposite of good. You like that? I'm pretty good with my vocab every once in a while. Uh, Wilkins was in on 58% of their snaps, Hines 45%. The takeaway here is obviously for one, Kristen Michael is far, far, far behind the other two in this backfield, which is a good thing if you're a Jordan Wilkins owner. He had just two carries and he played on 3% of the team's snaps. Now, Wilkins was used heavily inside the 10 zone, inside the 10 yard line, as well as on the goal line. Now, he didn't get in, but he got the carry when they were on the goal line. Um, and he was targeted down there by Andrew Luck, which is a good sign. Now, Hines, while he did see nine targets, caught seven of them. A lot of opportunities. When I rewatched the game, I would say that 80 to 90% of the opportunities he got in this one came at, in the two-minute drill. He was their two-minute drill running back, which was unsurprising. In both of the first and second half, all of his touches, not all of them, but like 80 to 90% of his touches came in the two-minute drill. Um, and I'm not really sure what that even means, to be honest with you, because they're going to keep using him in that role probably. But it doesn't seem like he was a big part of their game plan whatsoever beyond the two-minute drill. And if they're up in games, then obviously that is going to lower his ceiling and his floor because they're not going to use him as much as they normally would in games where they might have a two-minute drill. So the big question mark here is what happens when Marlon Mack returns to the lineup, which will be soon, right? He practiced on both Thursday and Friday last week before eventually being ruled inactive for week one. I uh, wanted to give him a little more time to rest. Now, the fact that none of the Indianapolis backs played well leaves the door wide open for Marlon Mack to kind of resume as the clear starter here in, uh, in the Colts' backfield. Um, but it's very possible that this remains a running back by committee for a long time. Um, but I will say, again, guys, the running backs that end up emerging and kind of exploding throughout the year that you had no idea of in the beginning of the season or, you know, you didn't see that coming always comes from ambiguous backfield. It's very rarely just handcuffs. So this is a situation where we could end up seeing an RB1 by the end of the year or at least one of those guys where, like, we'll look back next year and the analysis will be, and the analysis will be over the last eight weeks of last season – Player X, whether it's Jordan Wilkins or Marlon Mack, was a top 12 running back, right? And this could be one of those situations. So it might be tough to, to kind of wait it out for this long right now. 
Uh, but I think it's 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 worth taking a stab on either of these guys. Now, I would take Marlon Mack in a vacuum. Going forward right now, right? Having already gotten past week one where he wasn't played. But right now, I would take Marlon Mack in a vacuum. He's still available in 49% of leagues. Uh, Wilkins is not a bad consolation prize who's available in 64% of leagues. Seeing as he is the clear-cut starter if Marlon Mack is not back for week two. For now, none of them can be considered anything more than a very deeper flex desperate play. If uh, if Marlon Mack sits again, I wouldn't mind having Wilkins in my flex, I guess. But uh, but they all have that middle of the year kind of breakout upside, as I said. And uh, I'm not touching Hines anywhere but a full PPR league. So I would probably drop between seven and ten bucks for Mack. I would put in probably between five and seven for Jordan Wilkins at this point, and like a dollar or two for Naeem Hines. And the last running back I have on this list, assuming that none of the running backs from tonight's game are on my waiver wire list is Darren Sproles of the Philadelphia Eagles, man. 4% owned in Yahoo. Who would have thunk it? Actually, probably like most people. Most people probably should have kind of seen this coming, but it's clear that the Eagles have no plans on easing Darren Sproles into a workload, even at age 35, even coming off a torn ACL. Now, Sproles started for the Eagles in week one uh, against the Falcons on Thursday Night Football. He led the backfield at halftime in snaps with 21. Guy only had nine. Clement had Four. Now, the snap count would obviously tighten up as the game went on, and Jai kind of dominated that backfield in the second half. Uh, but Sproles still led the backfield with 29 plays overall to a Jai's 28. Now, Jai would bring home the bacon thanks to a couple touchdowns. I think Scott Pianowski said, said it great. He's like, uh, he was saying something about touchdown deodorant always makes things. Okay, I'm not even going to, I forget completely what he said, so I'm just going to pretend that I didn't even say any of this. Uh, but what I was saying was Sproles was heavily involved. He rushed five times for 10 yards, but more importantly, more importantly, more importantly, he was the only running back in the Eagles' backfield to even see a single target. He saw seven of them, to be precise. He caught four of those seven targets, only 22 yards, so not a good efficiency metric, but good to see the usage nonetheless. Obviously, he's going to be used in Philly. Obviously, he's going to be a part of this game plan. Um, and and the better part of this, in terms of what I just in terms of that piece of analysis, is that at no point were they trailing big. At no, at no point were they in hurry up mode. At no point were they trying to catch up to the Falcons. So that tells you, in a, a neutral game script, Darren Sproles is still going to be involved and still seeing seven targets, which is kind of crazy. So I mean, it is very possible that it had to do with the Falcons. And Doug Peterson is a very good head coach, so he knows the the opposing defenses. The Falcons' defensive scheme is pretty much we have really ridiculously fast linebackers, and we let you uh, roam over the middle of the field and give up short plays, right? And that's why Nelson Aguilar had so many catches, short yards. Darren Sproles, so many catches, short yards. That's what, we don't let up big plays. That's our defensive scheme, right? Um, so it's very possible that they schemed it that way, and that's why Darren Sproles was so heavily involved. But at the same time, can you really be surprised if Darren Sproles ends up leading this team in not only snaps but definitely receptions and, and and you know and that sort of thing? So Sproles is someone that I would be keeping an eye on if I'm in PPR leagues. He's probably a deeper play. He's not someone I want to have in my lineup, but he's someone that in a full PPR league I would probably be spending maybe like five six bucks because this is a good offense that should have the ball a lot, especially when Wentz gets back. They play at Indianapolis, Tampa Bay, at Tennessee. So no scary defenses over the next few weeks. He is someone, uh, he's someone that might surprise us this year in fantasy. So that will end the running back section for my top waiver wire ads. Before we move on to wide receivers, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video. Where'd you go, Fantasy Jocks? I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I gotta watch this play right quick. Let's see. Donald takes the hike. He drives back. He looks left. He goes to his second read. He throws it deep to Spaghetti Anderson. Touchdown. Wow. Nice throw by nice throw by Sam Darnold. And nice catch by Spaghetti. 41-yard touchdown reception. You know, I see people saying Spaghetti Anderson on Twitter, and I feel like I made that nickname up. But I don't remember if maybe someone else did it and then it just caught on, but I feel like I made Spaghetti Anderson up. And I feel like that's such a good nickname for him. His fucking arms are so damn long. Let me get that belt real quick, though. Hey! FantasyJocks.com is sponsoring today's video. Thank you very much, Fantasy Jocks. They are the industry leader, the number one fantasy football league gear website. FantasyJocks.com. They have championship belts. They have championship rings. They have championship trophies, Lombardi trophies. You can get the team's names engraved. Whoever wins the chips, so you can keep a running record of your league. I'm telling you, your league is much, much, much more fun when you got something on the line like a belt 
when you got something on the line, like a big ass trophy that you can put on your desk at work or something like that. So if you go to fantasyjocks.com and you use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, you will get 10% off your purchase. Your man's got your bike. Have everyone in your league chip in a few dollars and someone will take home a trophy this year, y'all. Fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. They're the GOAT. Put it that way. Just like Spaghetti Anderson's the GOAT, Fantasy Jocks is the GOAT. All right, so let's move on over to the wide receivers, the best catches, those playboys. My number one wide receiver pickup this week is, actually, I don't know if he's number one, because number two is also pretty damn good, but John Allison needs to be picked up in every league. The wide receiver three for the Green Bay Packers, 12% owned in Yahoo Leagues. Following the summer, I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Allison is uh, is the wide receiver three here. He played exclusively as the Packers wide receiver three in their week one game and was uh, very productive in that role. So he played on 63% of Green Bay's offensive snaps in this one. Cobb played on 81%, Adams on 89%. And the only rookie of those, you know, there's a lot of uh, hype around the rookies that were coming into Green Bay and how one of them might take one of the slots there. The only rookie that even played a single snap was Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and that's exactly what he played, just a single snap. So Rodgers was dropping dimes out there over the second half, obviously, when he returned from that knee injury. And uh, he peppered all three of the top wideouts with targets here. Um, all three of them ended up catching a touchdown. Allison, of course, caught a beautiful deep pass from Rodgers. It was a 39-yard touchdown strike. He, he mixed in a few different, uh, uh, you know, other catches that were more intermediate, so it was good to see him kind of working all over the field. He's not like the fastest guy ever, but it was good to see him beat one of the cornerbacks deep. He's also a, uh, a client of Vayner Sports. For those of you who don't know what Vayner Sports is, Gary Vaynerchuk, the god, runs a sports agency now, and Jer uh, Geronimo Allison is one of his clients. Thus, I like him even more now. I didn't know that before last night So until I saw Gary V tweeting about it. But now Geronimo Allison is a must-own. So what are we, uh, what, what the hell were we even talking about? So yeah, Allison is really, I mean, the analysis doesn't really need to go much further than he is the wide receiver three here. And that's good enough to be owned as long as Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback here in Green Bay. Randall Cobb went bonkers, but that foot still scares me a little bit, man. I understand that he was heavily utilized and he looked really good and the foot wasn't a problem, but they were still shopping him and there's still a decent chance that that foot ends up um, causing an issue at some point in this year. If either of those two top wide receivers in Cobb or Adams go down, Allison is going to be in for a monster workload in a ridiculously good role for this Green Bay offense. They play Minnesota at Washington, Buffalo over their next three. Um, I would spend probably between $15 to $25 on drawing my Allison at this point. And my number two waiver wire pick, and this is why I didn't want to say number one for Allison, was uh, it's Chris Godwin. It's actually a mixture of Chris Godwin to Sean Jackson. I would rather pick up Chris Godwin right now. Both of them, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, White House, of course. Uh, Yahoo ownership is at 30% for Godwin, only 25% from Deshaun Jackson. I mean, let me start off by, by saying this. I literally sat Mike Evans this week. Because Steve, Steve walked in my room on Sunday morning as I was live streaming and I was like, yo, Mike Evans or Doug Baldwin? I got Mike Evans in, I think I'm going to start him. So he's like, no, nah, you got to go Doug Baldwin. Keep in mind, Steve has never played fantasy football in his entire life. He doesn't watch football. He probably doesn't even know who Doug Baldwin is or Mike Evans, to be honest with you. You know, me being the good friend that I am, I put in uh, Doug Baldwin and I sat Mike Evans. So I'm going to end up losing my game by, I think, 22 points. Doug Baldwin had zero points. Mike Evans had 24 points. So um, that didn't go so well. So that was my top horror story of, of week one of fantasy football. But guys, it's a long, it's a long season. There are a lot of moves to be made, a lot of dubs to take throughout the rest of the year. Don't get crazy. Week one is like 7% of your fantasy football season. There's plenty more to be done in the future. So I'm not fretting about it. You can joke about it. If I end up missing out on the playoffs by one game, then there's a good chance I'm going to kill Steve. Uh, literally, I'm going to kill him. So if he goes missing, you could use this as evidence in the court of law. And I'm not really going to be too upset about it. But let's talk some analysis on Chris Godwin, Sean Jackson, what we saw from them in week one. Fitzpatrick and this Bucks offense was literally out of control. Uh, every receiver in this pass offense ate on Sunday. No tight ends ate, but every receiver in this offense ate. Um, that was Godwin, that was Jackson, that was Evans, both available in over 70% of Yahoo leagues, referring to the 
former two, of course. Um, you already know Godwin was one of my favorite wide receiver sleepers coming into this year, and he didn't disappoint again. He played on 67% of snaps, which is a very good number. Um, he converted four targets into three catches for 41 yards and a touchdown. Uh, he caught a slant up the middle on a pass from Fitzpatrick where he, like, dove full extension. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was a ridiculous catch by Godwin. So a really good game from him. Um, and then Deshaun Jackson went fucking nuts, of course. He caught all five of his targets, 146 yards, two touchdowns. The touchdowns came from 58 yards out. The other one came from 36 yards out. He basically did yesterday, or on Sunday's game, what everyone thought he was going to do when he first came over to this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense in 2017. Um, however, however, Djax left the game in the fourth quarter with a uh, with a concussion. So his Week 2 status is up in the air right now. Now, if Jackson is out, Godwin will be in line for a huge workload, and Godwin will probably deliver, even if it's against his Philly defense. Um, so as I've mentioned before, and as John Paulson of 4 for 4 Fantasy tweeted out this summer, quote-unquote, in five games where Chris Godwin played at least 50% of the Buccaneers' snaps, he has averaged 4.2 receptions, uh, 73 receiving yards, and .2 touchdowns on 7.2 targets per game. Um, and then I went ahead and added in Sunday's game, and that has, for all of the games in which Godwin has played at least 50% of the snaps, six games, 24 catches, 406 receiving yards, and two touchdowns in six games. Now, they have a tough game, uh, of course, at home versus Philly next week, uh, but honestly, I would be comfortable putting Godwin in my flex if uh, Deshaun Jackson is out. After Philly, they get Pittsburgh at home, and then they go to Chicago. So I will spend uh, $15 on Chris Godwin. Um, at this point, and probably like 8 to $10 on Deshaun Jackson. Moving down the list, oh my god, uh, we're getting desperate here, and this one honestly hurts to say. Um, Brandon Marshall, Seattle Seahawks, Yahoo owned 8%. Uh, but with Doug Baldwin, man, he's like one in one knee injury away from like literally not having legs anymore. So at this point, Marshall seems to be the next guy up in terms of being the number one possession receiver on Seattle. Now, Seattle's still gauging exactly how long Doug Baldwin is going to miss, and I've seen on Twitter anywhere from like two to seven weeks. It is a grade two MCL sprain, I believe, um, which typically results in a two to three week absence, pending severity, whatever. Um, so we, we really don't know I have a timetable yet. So depending on if there are reports by the time this video comes out, Marshall could be either more or less valuable. Um, but Marshall served as a Seahawks top wide receiver when Doug Baldwin left the game on Sunday. He caught three of six targets, 46 yards, and he touched down. Um, and, he's, and he served Russell Wilson as a primary end zone target. Now, obviously, Jimmy Graham is gone. Paul Richardson is gone. Baldwin is going to be out for an extended period. Russell Wilson is badly in need of both playmakers and options in the end zone. He needs end zone threats. And we know that Brandon Marshall, even if he can't run anymore, he will still always be a, an end zone threat at like 6'3", 6'4". I'm sure he could still jump, and I'm sure uh, he will be utilized in this offense if, if Doug Baldwin misses an extended period of time. Now, Lockett is probably owned in more than 55% of leagues, but he's obviously a good pickup as well. I just think Lockett kind of has, has an inherent ceiling in him as the type of fantasy player he is. He caught a long touchdown pass, and that will happen uh, with Lockett throughout the year, but it's hard to predict that week over week. When you have a guy like Marshall who's going to be more of a possession receiver and will probably take more of the targets that Doug Baldwin leaves behind, um, I would pr probably prefer... Marshall at this point to Tyler Lockett, to be honest with you. So I would spend, uh, I would probably throw between 10 and $12 for Marshall right now, depending on the severity of Baldwin. So if we have like two to three weeks, probably on the lower side, but if, you know, if Baldwin's out for like six weeks or something, reports come out, then I would think about throwing somewhere between like 15 and maybe even $20 for Brandon Marshall. So we move down to John Brown, of Baltimore Ravens, owned in 20% of Yahoo Leagues with a revamped group of weapons. We saw Lord Joey Flacco, shout out ASAP. Uh, he took his game to new heights on Sunday. He connected with all three of his new weapons, Willie Sneed, John Brown, Michael Crabtree, four tutties, a couple scores through the air. Actually, three scores, a trio of scores for Joey Flacco. John Brown would finish the game, holding in three or four targets, 44 yards, and a score. He saw multiple end zone targets, which was obviously good to see. He played in 60% of the snaps. Only Michael Crabtree played in more snaps. He had 64% of the team snaps. Um, the Ravens obviously got up huge. So they demolished the Bills, right, 47-3. to three. So we didn't really get a good, clear picture of what the workload would have been or what his production would have been had we had the entire stretch of the game. But it's clear that Brown is just as much of a full-time player as Crabtree. And I think Brown obviously serves much more big play potential. And, you know, I think a lot of people were comparing, like, John Ross and 
and uh, and John Brown in this offseason. And unlike John Ross, though, uh, who I think is a good player, John Brown has actually done it, and he's produced on an NFL field before. So health was always the issue, and now it seems like you know his health checks out, and he's ready to roll. At any point, obviously, something could come down where his health is affected. But for now, and he's been healthy throughout the entire summer. He's been healthy throughout the regular season so far. So John Brown is definitely a guy I'm targeting. I, could, I, I see him as someone that could definitely end up leading the Ravens in targets. Uh, and if you were curious, Willie Sneed was actually the slot receiver for Baltimore in this one. He ran 84% of his snaps out of the slot. Um, I'm not really too high on Sneed, and I would rather have Crabtree or Brown than Sneed, and I would rather have Brown than Crabtree at this point. So the Ravens get a much tougher slate over the next three games, so we'll find out exactly where we stand with this, res this receiving core. Over the next few weeks, they travel to Cincinnati for Thursday Night Football, then they get Denver at home, and then they travel to Pittsburgh for another AFC South, AFC, AFC North. Yes, it is AFC North. So I'd spend probably between 6 and $8 on John Brown. Next up, we got Ryan Grant of the Indianapolis Colts, 3% owned in Yahoo Leagues. Now, I'm not particularly excited about Grant. I think he is upside. His upside is, is kind of capped as a playmaker and just his ability overall. However, he saw nine targets from Andrew Luck on Sunday, um, and he caught a team-high eight passes. A lot of you guys probably didn't know about that. He caught eight passes. Uh, so it was clear the Colts' game plan was and where Andrew Luck was targeting most of his throws, right? They were short. They were over the middle. I think that he's going to have to work his way into a lot of deep passes. Uh, now, Andrew Luck, you know, he looked as good as you can ask for in, in his first regular season start in, in this long of time, right? Um, <clears throat> and I think he's going to get stronger and stronger as the year goes on. So uh, if I'm a Luck owner, I'm pretty pleased with how the first game went about. He did throw the ball 53 times, which is crazy considering you'd think they would like take it easy on his arm, but I guess that's just not how the game plan works. So threw the ball 53 times. A lot of those were at or behind the line of scrimmage, uh, but 53 times paces out to like 850 throws or something like that, which is crazy. But again, I think he gets stronger as the year goes on. Uh, he had a few beautiful strikes that were, you know, long, that traveled in the area, that touchdown to Ebron. He had a really nice deep throw to T.Y. Hilton, who he dropped it right in a basket, and T.Y. Hilton just it slipped right off his fingertips. So he, he could have had a much bigger day as well. Um, but back to Ryan Grant, right? He had nine targets. He, he turned those into 59 yards. So if you're looking from a PPR standpoint, eight catches, 59 yards, that's nearly 14 points in PPR. Um, and I think that's where you're going to make your money. I wouldn't really touch him in standard leagues, and I'm even hesitant in half PPR, but I think he gives you a nice floor play, and I think he's going to have multiple, uh, plenty of double-digit PPR fantasy points going forward. And I think he's clearly the wide receiver, too, in this offense. T.Y. Hilton, Ryan Grant, uh, they have the tight ends that are heavily involved, and they have Naeem Hines, who had nine targets. But um, Ryan Grant is a guy who should uh, continue to run a lot of uh, routes from the slot as well as outside and uh, get a lot of those short, intermediate passes from Luck as his, uh, his arm gets stronger. He will still utilize those shorter passes. So we'll move on to number six, Ted Ginn of the New Orleans Saints. Yahoo ownership, 17%. I think a lot of people were uh, really excited about seeing Traquan Smith in this one, right? A lot of hype throughout the preseason, or a lot of uh, hype throughout the entire summer, and they thought he would eventually take over the Teddy Ginn role, and this would have literally been the perfect game to do so with uh, them down a lot of points and them needing to take a lot of shots downfield. Traquan Smith, that's his game, right? He's a deep ball guy. He makes plays down the field. That didn't happen. What's crazy is Ginn went 5 for 68 in a touchdown, and he was literally like the fifth or sixth most impressive receiving performance in this game. So the takeaway here, though, is Teddy Ginn is the clear wide receiver two in this offense in one that projects to be a high-scoring offense that projects the passing game to be a lot higher in volume this year as compared to last year, and especially if this defense takes a step back. Breeze will be throwing the ball a lot more. Michael Thomas was clearly an every-down player, uh, but Ted Ginn played on 77% of the Saints' snaps while, um, oh, I didn't even fill in who was third. Oh, Austin Carr was third, seeing 64% of their snaps, and Meredith didn't suit up. Uh, Traquan Smith was on the field for less than 16% of the team snaps. So Ted again, again, is clearly the number two wide receiver in this offense. And what's interesting, though, when I was looking, I was looking at like slots and where people lined up in the for their routes and stuff. According to Pro Football Focus, Teddy Ginn took 55% of his snaps from the slot, while Austin Carr was in the slot for only 35%, 33% of his snaps. I thought Austin Carr was going to be the slot receiver. Michael Thomas actually was in the slot for 51% of his snaps as well. It's kind of weird. I don't know how that math adds up here, but what I know is I remember seeing a bunch of tweets throughout the summer that Michael Thomas is 
dominant from the slot. So when they use him in the slot, he is so good, and that's what we saw a lot from uh, in this game. I think he in in snaps that he lined up from the slot, he was targeted on like 55% of those routes. So when Michael Thomas is in the slot and it looks like they're going to be using him in the slot a lot, uh, he's going to end up with a lot of games like this, guys. I know they were in like comeback mode, but I'm pretty sure Michael Thomas has a good shot to lead the league in uh, receptions this year. So he could very much finish as a top three, if not the wide receiver one overall in fantasy. But regardless, Ginn is the wide receiver two for Drew Brees. They play a majority of their games uh, in a dome, right? They get half their games at home, and then they get some of their games against, you know, on the road, but also in dome. So Ginn is a good play as a deep stretcher, and he will have plenty of games like this throughout the year. They get Cleveland at home, at Atlanta, at New York Giants. Uh, I'd spend probably between four and six bucks on Teddy Ginn. And just a couple more wide receivers, I promise, guys. Uh, Dante Pettis of the San Francisco 49ers, owned in 1% of Yahoo Leagues currently. His second-round rookie pick out of Washington. They traded up to get him. He looked fantastic in Sunday's game against Minnesota. While their passing offense did not look fantastic, Pettis was definitely a bright spot here. He was running crisp routes. He was getting separation against good cornerbacks, especially against uh, the Vikings' first-round pick, Mike Hughes, their top cornerback um, from the draft this year. He'd, uh, he'd wind up finishing the game, Dante Pettis would, with 61 yards and a touchdown catch on two of five targets. So the big storyline here is, of course, Marquise Goodwin, who left the game early with a quad injury. He tried to return. He had to end up leaving the game again. It's definitely a situation you need to be closely monitoring if you are a Marquise Goodwin owner. I mean, it's impossible to predict injuries, guys, but I did tweet this out a few weeks ago, and this was cons like very, very, very concerning. This is Marquise Goodwin's injury history over the last like four or five years. Look how many injuries he has dealt with. The concussion is a scary thing. He was like, he's like one concussion away from being dead pretty much. So you add another injury to this already concerning list. It's not a good thing for Marquise Goodwin. If you were to miss time here, George Kittle, Pierre Garcon, Dante Pettis would all get a bump. Pettis will become a full-time player without Goodwin. He played on 73% of their snaps uh, in the week one's game. So that was almost a full-time player. If Gar Goodwin is out, then that number should increase even more. Um, Pettis is a solid ad, man, although they do get a tough slate of games. Like in my top trade targets video where I had Marquise Goodwin as someone to avoid in the beginning of the year due to his tough schedule, it kind of transfers over to Dante Pettis. However, Trent Taylor is going to operate in the slot, and Garcon is going to be on the outside. Other teams would probably treat Garcon as a wide receiver one in this offense, which means Pettis will not get uh, Darius Slay next week. He will not get Casey Hayward in L.A., and I think their week five game is maybe Arizona, uh, Arizona, so maybe he won't get Patrick Peterson, all depending on if Goodwin misses time, of course. Um, so Pettis could low-key be in for a really dynamite stretch over the next few games. So I like him as a uh, as a, a deeper stash here. And the last wide receiver on this list is Philip Dorsett of the New England Patriots, owned in 4% of Yahoo Leagues. Like I was saying before, biggest L that the brand took in Week 1 had to have been Chris Hogan. Now, Hogan did dominate the snap uh, counts here in New England. He just seemed to be phased out of the game plan. I'm not really sure what happened, man. I really, I don't know. They just seem to be using the running backs and the tight ends more than any other position. So Dorsett basically operated in the Brandon Cooks role. He led all of the Patriots wideouts with seven targets. He caught all seven of those targets for 66 yards and a touchdown. He even added four rushing yards. So bing, bang, boom. Dorsett, whoever started him, great call by you. I don't know why you would have started him, but awesome. So like I was saying, Hogan led the Patriots in snaps. He played on 89% of their downs. Dorsett wasn't far off. He played on 75.3% of their snaps. The next closest wide receiver was Corderell Patterson at just 20.5% of the snaps. So it's Dorsett and it's Chris Hogan until Julian Edelman comes back. Um, and again, they opted to utilize their tight ends and the running backs as they always do in the passing game. I'm still very high on Hogan, guys. Um, he ran 26 of his 69 snaps from the slot, which usually translates into fantasy points when you are uh, a Patriots receiver and you have Brady throwing to you. So I think this is going to be an anomaly of a game for Chris Hogan. But, I mean, at the same time, it does warrant concern, uh, real concern, that you just might not know what you're getting from this Patriots offense on any given week, on a week-to-week -week basis. And they do have... A really tough matchup next week as they travel to Jacksonville. They'll be on the road against probably the best pass defense in the league. Um, but you could probably fire up Dorsett in weeks three and four, at least while Edelman is out. They play at Detroit uh, and then home against Miami. So he could be a flex play for you guys in PPR leagues. 
And that wraps up the wide receiver portion, and we'll move on to tight ends. We've got a pretty big tight end list considering all the injuries that happened this week. Okay, so we had some monster, monster injuries this this uh, this week. We had Delaney Walker. We had Greg Olson. We had there's someone else. I can't think of who it was. I don't know. I'm sure it'll come up as I'm going down the list here. My number one waiver wire pickup uh, of the week for tight ends. Owned in under 55% of Yahoo leagues. Of course, sticking with the theme. Jonu Smith of the Tennessee Titans. Owned in 1% of leagues. I want to do a quick moment of silence. Rip, rip, rip. RIP to a real one. Delaney Walker, man. Fractured his ankle. Um, messed up some ligaments as well. He will be out for the entirety of the year. Next man up, Jonu Smith. He's someone that I spoke about in a video I made earlier this year. Uh, it was all about dynasty leagues and keeper leagues, so late round picks in those leagues for guys whose contracts were expiring or older players or whatever, guys who are next up in line. Jonah Smith was the guy and will be the heir apparent to Delaney Walker. Now, I want you to check him out here. This is his player profiler profile. You can find any of these for any player in the NFL on playerprofiler.com. It's an awesome, awesome resource and awesome website. Um, and as you can see, he has ridiculously good metrics, right? 6'3", 248, so he's kind of got that hybrid build of a receiving tight end. 92nd percentile spark athlete, very young, just 23 years old, but he got to learn behind Delaney Walker all year. Last year during his rookie season, they went to the playoffs, so he has some experience with that as well. So I think that should get him up to speed. You know, young tight ends usually struggle to get adapted to the league, but I think the fact that he got to learn behind Delaney Walker definitely helps. Um, and I think he's in a really good spot to... Give you some good value if you can scoop him off your waiver wire. Uh, but obviously the concern here is Marcus Mariota. He left the game on Sunday. He injured his hand, I believe it was. And uh, we don't know what his status is going to be for week two or going on. Supposedly they said he's going to play. If he does not play, Blaine Gabbert will be the quarterback. If Blaine Gabbert is a quarterback, you are not starting any pass catchers in Tennessee offense. Understood? But if Mariota is back, and reports are saying he is likely to play next week, uh, then Smith is a guy I want on my roster. They have a really tough schedule over the, the next few weeks, Houston at Jacksonville, Philadelphia. But Gronk also did just eat against Houston. So Smith, I think, will be in the tight end two discussion all year. Um, and he definitely has tight end one upside. There are always guys that emerge throughout the fantasy season. And Jonu Smith, as you can see by his metrics, great athlete. Um, he had a few touchdowns last year in back-to-back -back games proven that he could do it on the field as well. Just uh, someone that I think could really step into this Laney Walker role and start producing immediately if Mariota's in the backfield, or if Mariota's under center, of course. Moving on to Benjamin Watson of the New Orleans Saints, owned in 39% of Yahoo leagues. I mean, it's just old reliable, man. Uh, Watson somehow came away from the shootout in New Orleans with just uh, four catches on four targets. So he caught all four of his targets, which is good, 44 yards. So it's a decent PPR play. But it's just a reminder that he is a high floor, medium ceiling PPR play in this offense. Breeze was slinging the fall. Uh, basically, the reason I think he didn't really come away with huge production while you look at Michael Thomas and Ted Ginn and Kamara, who did, uh, they were taking advantage of what the Bucks were giving them. And that was the lack of depth at the cornerback position. They had like no D-backs. And uh, they are just a bad passing defense altogether. Brent Grimes was out for the game, so he was attacking the cornerbacks. He was attacking downfield the whole time. So Benjamin Watson was not really part of the game plan. But I expect him to be much more involved going forward into the season. I mean, he's old, but he's still super reliable pass catcher. He's still moving really, really well, making plays throughout the entire summer. And again, caught all four of his targets for 44 yards. So it's a good PPR play. Um, and I think he's going to use... Watson, I think Breeze is going to use Watson in the red zone as they're playing in more close games and it's not so much like Hail Marys and shootouts and things like that. And we saw it back in 2015 when Watson was the tight end in New Orleans and he caught 74 passes from him. Um, so they take on Cleveland at home, at Atlanta, at New York Giants. So two matchups they could absolutely exploit in Cleveland and New York. Um, so Ben Watson is definitely a streamer if you are someone that had the uh, injury bug this week. So numero trace. Eric Ebron of the Indianapolis Colts, owned in 33% of leagues. Here's what I'll say about Ebron. This is the tweet I had earlier uh, yesterday. This is the splits between Jack Doyle and Ebron yesterday. Everyone's getting really excited about Ebron, obviously, because he caught a touchdown. But when you look at the numbers, Doyle had 10 targets, 7 receptions. Ebron, 5 targets, 4 receptions. Around the same yardage. But Doyle had a 19% target share, 9.4% for Eric Ebron. 
Doyle played in 95% of the snaps. Ebron only 44, under 44% of the snaps. Guys, we know that touch, touchdowns tend to fluctuate. We know that the tight ends in Indianapolis are uh, going to score a lot of touchdowns. So if the touchdowns are going towards Doyle, he's going to be a very good play. But for now, um, I mean, Ebron looked as good as you could have asked him to look if you are someone who likes Ebron, of course. Um, I'm not someone who was sold on him. I'm someone who's been Team Jack Doyle, and I think... Ebron obviously came away with the touchdown, but Doyle, in terms of usage, I mean, 7 for 60, that's a really good PPR play. Um, Doyle is obviously still my guy, but Ebron is the one who is unowned in leagues. That being said, you know, Luck uses his tight ends near the end zone as much as anyone in the NFL, and the trend doesn't seem to be stopping now that he's back. Uh, as he starts ramping up his arm and he continues to use the safer part of the field, these tight ends are going to be continued to uh, be very involved in the offense. So uh, I think you're probably going to need a touchdown out of Ebron in order for him to have good weeks. Like, he did catch five passes or four passes, but again, this was a game where Andrew Luck threw the ball 53 times, and we're not going to see that. Uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, if that goes down to a normal, like, 35 pass attempts, you know, somewhere in that range, then Ebron's 9.4% target share uh, is really only going to get him between three and four targets a game, and that's not really usable, but for now, Ebron looks like someone that could emerge, depending on what happens, but I still like Doyle more. Uh, Ian Thomas, Carolina Panthers, this is the next guy up for Greg Olson. Now, Greg Olson came off the field with uh, with a foot injury. He re-injured the foot that, was, that he had surgery on and that he dealt with last year and whatever, and he was seen in a walking boot. It could be precautionary, but he's probably going to be missing a good amount of time, um, if not a very long extended period of time. Now, Ian Thomas uh, will take over Greg Olson's role. He is a fourth-round rookie that the Panthers drafted this year out of the University of Indiana. You look at his player profiler. Profile! The metrics are good. He's uh, got he's pretty big. Big dude. 6'4", 260. Good burst, as you can see, 83rd percentile. Agility, 76th percentile. Catch radius, 83rd percentile. Um, he had a, a little bit of a mini breakout in terms of putting himself on the map as a receiving tight end in his final year at the University of Indiana. He caught 25 passes, which isn't a huge number, but he did average 15 yards per reception on those 25 passes, and he scored five times. Um, reports out of camp all summer were pretty much that this rookie, Ian Thomas, was uh, one of the big surprises out of camp, and the, you know they were liking what they what they saw out of him. So I highly doubt we see near the level of production that we saw from Greg Olson from Ian Thomas, just because you know that's that's Greg Olson. He was just a, he's just been a great player. But this is a role in an offense that has commanded anywhere from twenty to twenty five percent of the target share since Greg Olson has been in the offense. So. It's notable, and I think it just needs to be put out there for the people that are unaware of Ian Thomas. Um, and again, it's probably like a chicken or the egg, but it's very likely that it's just because Olsen was the guy there, not because that role automatically commands 20 to 25 percent of the target share. So they play at Atlanta, then they play home against Cincinnati, then they play home against the Giants. Um, that's actually not too bad of a slate. I just don't think Ian Thomas is going to fill right in that role. Again, it's a uh, He's a rookie, and rookie tight ends seem to take a pretty long time to get involved in their offense and really get things clicking because they need to know all the blocking and the route running assignments. So Ian Thomas is more of a name to just keep an eye on, along with this guy, Will Disley of the Seattle Seahawks. Owned in, I'm surprised he's even owned in 2% of leagues. It must have been leagues that let you pick up immediately. But he was one of the biggest surprises of week one. He is a fourth-round rookie tight end out of the University of Washington. 6'4", 255 pounds. I need to read all this because I have no idea who this guy even is. He isn't even in the player profiler database, so I couldn't give you anything there. He was profiled as a black... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I promise there's no racism on this channel. He is profiled as a blocking tight end. And uh, he didn't catch many balls in college, but he went off on Sunday night. Bringing in three of five targets from Russell Wilson gaining 105 receiving yards on three catches and scored a touchdown. So it's notable, right? And it's possible that this is the biggest game of, of the year for him. And it's very possible that this might be the biggest game of his career. Who knows? Um, but there is a gaping red zone hole, given the departure of Jimmy Graham and Paul Richardson and now Doug Baldwin. Just the same points that I'm making for Brandon Marshall. Will Disley, you never know. He could emerge. Him and Nick Vanette, who was more expected to play the pass-catching tight end role in this offense, both played on exactly 60.8% of Seattle's offensive snaps. Now, if we see the split slowly starting to creep more towards Disley, he'll be uh, someone to keep an eye on. But for now, again, like so the whole Seahawks offense is kind of someone, uh, kind of a bunch of pieces that you really don't want to have in your lineup, to be honest, between the backfield and the tight ends. Like I said, I do like Marshall, but Disley uh, could be a one-hit wonder. The last tight end I have on this list is Jesse James of the Pittsburgh Steelers. 4%, and this is 
boring as shit to pick this. I'm like upset that I even needed to waste my time writing this part and putting it out to you guys. But as long as Vance McDonald is sidelined, which is pretty damn often, Jesse James, the outlaw, is going to be an option for Big Ben in the passing game. And they get Kansas City at home next week. Um, James caught three or five targets in their season opener for 60 yards on Sunday. So that's probably an output around there that you can expect on a week-to-week -week basis as long as Jesse James is the starting tight end. You know, give or take a target, a reception, 15 to 20 uh, receiving yards. So he's not like the worst play. Um, and he probably gives you a 30% chance of scoring a touchdown on any given week. So it's not exciting, but if you're in a 14 or a 16 team league and you lost your guy to an injury on Sunday, he's not the worst pickup. Like I said, they get KC, then they play at Tampa Bay, um, and then Baltimore. So he's someone to keep an eye on. And the last, the last one I will say is there's not one specific player I want from this, but keep an eye on the Ravens tight end situation. It's kind of intriguing. So there was uh, Nick Boyle. Max Williams and Mark Andrews all played. Nick Boyle led the team or led the tight end group with 64.4% of the team snaps. Uh, Max Williams was the second highest percentage. And then Mark Andrews, the rookie, uh, while Hayden Hurst, the other rookie, is sidelined. Now, all three tight ends caught three passes and all three had at least 30 yards receiving. All three had at least one red zone reception as well. So they were all utilized. So as we've seen in previous seasons, the tight end position for Baltimore can turn into a valuable one, especially in PPR formats, man. We've seen it over the years that Joe Flacco likes to use the tight end. They might not score a lot of touchdowns. They might not have the highest yardage total, but they do get it done in terms of reception. So if one of these tight ends starts to creep away from the pack, and I'm, I'm not sure we're really going to see that consistently, they are someone to keep an eye on. But that's going to wrap up this week's waiver wire. God damn, this was a long one. I don't know if I'm going to keep doing videos like this. In, or if I'm just going to do recap videos week over week, but we'll figure it out anyways. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, I would really, 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 really appreciate a thumbs up. If you are listening via podcast, a rating and a review would be uh, very much appreciated because obviously I put a lot of work into these bad boys. If you are new to the channel, subscribe. We will be doing these weekly and hopefully uh, ramping you guys up and helping you get to your playoffs and taking home the chip. If you want your question to be featured on Thursday's Q&A video again all you got to do is go to facebook.com slash bdge standing for big dogs gotta eat of course bdge fantasy football send the page a message with hashtag answer my zam question uh, make sure you put the week the scoring settings all that kind of stuff and i might pick your question so i will see y'all on thursday peace